Thank you for having us. Thank you, Hero Econ, for bringing us over. Thank you, Hesna and uh, Giordi. I hope I pronounced it rightly. We are really grateful to be here. Uh, every story that we had today was overwhelming. Every lecture that we had today was unbelievable. Uh, we are deeply moved, and I think uh, we have no, nothing to add to it, but uh, humble, uh, grateful. Uh, this uh, Palestinian Arab terrorist to my right <laughs> is uh, my brother. You can sit down. Thank you. Is uh, my dear brother, Bassam Amin. In uh, so many ways, he's the closest person to me on earth. He's much closer to me than many of my own people, many of my own family. What makes us so close is uh, the pain that we share. We paid the highest price possible as an outcome of this ongoing conflict between our two nations. We don't need words to understand each other. For me, he's a, a leader. I look up to him, I admire him, and I take a lot of strength out of him and uh, my other uh, dear uh, brothers and sisters, members of this unique organization, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian Bereaved Families Forum, the Parent Circle. My name is uh, Rami el -Hanan. I'm a 68 years old graphic designer living in Jerusalem. I was born in Jerusalem, seventh generation. My uh, mother was born in the old city of uh, Jerusalem, an ultra-Orthodox uh, Jewish family. My uh, father came to Israel uh, after spending one year in Auschwitz. He was born in Kishvare, here in this country, in Hungary. Uh, he was very badly wounded in the 48 war. She was the nurse that took care of him, and this is the reason why I'm able to speak to you right now. I am a Jew, I am an Israeli, and before anything else, I am a human being. And the story I will tell you this evening starts and also ends on one particular day of the Jewish calendar, which is known by the name of Yom Kippur. A few days ago it happened. Uh, this is the holiest day of the year for the Jews. This is the day where you ask forgiveness for your sins. On this uh, very day, 44 years ago, I was a very young soldier fighting this horrible October 73 war. We have uh, started it with a company of uh, 11 tanks. We finished it with only three. I've lost over there in the desert of Sinai and across the Suez Canal some of my very close friends. And I came out of this war a very angry and bitter and disappointed young man with one determination to detach myself from any kind of commitment, any kind of involvement. I got out of the army. I uh, got married. I had four kids. I went to Bezalel Art School to become a graphic designer. And uh, 34 years ago, on the very eve of Yom Kippur, September 1983, my daughter was born in Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem. Her name was Smadar. The name Smadar is taken from the Bible, the Song of Solomon. It means the grape of vine, which means the opening of the flower. A very sparkling and vivid and joyful little girl. She was uh, extremely beautiful. She was uh, an excellent student. She was a swimmer. She was a dancer. She played the piano. She was amazing. Everybody used to call her the princess. And uh, we lived a very good life in our house in uh, Jerusalem. My wife, which is a professor for education in the Hebrew University, my three boys in this uh, princess, in what seemed to be the perfect, protected, sheltered lives. I was doing graphic design for the right wing, for the left wing, whoever paid. And uh, in many ways, you could say that we put ourselves into a big bubble, completely detached from the outside world. 
minding our own businesses. And this went on until almost exactly 20 years ago. On the 4th of September, 1997, this bubble of ours was blown up to millions of pieces. Two uh, Palestinian suicide bombers blew themselves up in Ben Yehuda Street in the center of Jerusalem, killing five people that day, including three little girls. One of these girls was my 14 years old Smadar. It was Thursday afternoon. And the beginning of a very long and a very dark and frozen night, which continues until today. At first, when you hear about the explosion, you keep hoping that maybe this time this finger will not turn towards you. Then gradually, you find yourself running in the streets, trying to find her. She completely disappeared. And you go from hospital to hospital, from police station to police station, many long and uh, frustrating hours until eventually, very, very later that night, you find yourself in the morgue. And this finger is stuck right between your eyes. And you see this sight, which you will never, ever be able to forget for the rest of your life. And then you come back home, the house immediately filled with thousands and thousands of people coming to pay respect, to offer condolences. These are the Jewish mourning period, traditional. It's called Shiva. You are kind of enveloped by these thousands of people in a very clever, traditional way that is designed to ease your passage to the new kind of life which expects you. On the eighth day, everybody goes back to their normal, everyday businesses, suddenly you are left alone, and you need to wake up. You need to stand up and face yourself, and you have to make a decision. What are you going to do now? What are you going to do now with this new uh, burden on your shoulders? What are you going to do now with this new personality of yourself, which you never thought could have existed? What are you going to do with this anger that eats you alive from within? And there are only two ways to choose from. And the first one is obvious. When someone kills your 14 years old little girl, you are so angry. And you want to get even. When someone punches you in the face, the automatic response is punch back. And this is natural. And this is human. This is the way most People choose the way of revenge and retaliation, the way that creates this endless cycle of violence which never stops. But then, uh, after a while, you start to think, you know, we are human beings, we are not animals. And you start uh, asking yourself questions. Will killing anyone will bring her back? Will causing pain to someone, will ease this unbearable pain? Well, the answer is certainly not. So we're in a very graduate and complicated process. You come to the other option, which is much more difficult. Trying to understand what happened here. How could it happen? How could such a horrible thing take place? What can cause someone to be that angry, that mad, that hopeless and desperate that he's willing to blow himself up with 14 years old little girl? Do you have some connection to it? Some responsibility? And then the most important question of them all, what can you do personally in order to prevent this unbearable pain from other people, from other families? Well, it's not easy. It takes time. Foolishly enough, at the beginning, I thought that I could go back to my life, pretending as if nothing had happened, go back to my studio. But uh, very... Rapidly, I found out that uh, I was not the same person anymore, and life was not the same anymore. Nothing was normal anymore. About a year later, on some occasion, I met a big man who changed my life completely. His name was Yitzhak Frankenthal. He was a religious Jewish guy, you know, with a kippah on his head. And you know how we tend to put people into drawers and stigmatize people, and we judge people by the way they dress? And I automatically assumed that he's a fascist and a right-winger, that uh, he eats Arabs for breakfast. And I prepared myself to fight him. We started talking. He told me about his son, Arik, a soldier who was kidnapped and murdered by Hamas in 1994. 
And about this organization that he created of people who lost their loved ones and still wanted peace and searched for peace. And I remember then that this guy, Itzhak Frankenthal, was one of these thousands of people that came to my house a year before during the seven days of mourning, and I went crazy. I was so angry with him. I asked him, how could you do it? How could you step into someone's house who just lost a loved one and talk about peace? How dare you? And he, being the great guy that he is, was not insulted. He just invited me over to watch a meeting of this group of crazy people. And I got a little bit curious. I said, OK. I went to see it. It was 19 years ago. I was standing aside, very detached and very reluctant and very cynical, as I always am. And I was watching the people coming down from the buses. And from the buses came down people that, for me, as an Israeli patriot, were always living legends. People, uh, I used to look up to them and admire them. People I used to read about them in the newspapers, and I never ever thought that one day I will become one of them. People who lost their children and still search for a way for peace and reconciliation. But then I saw something which was completely new to me, to my eyes, to my mind, to my soul. I was standing there watching the uh, Palestinian bereaved families coming down from the buses, walking towards me, shaking my hand for peace, hugging me, crying with me. And I was so deeply shocked and so deeply moved. You see, I was uh, 47 years old at the time. And until today, I'm ashamed to admit it was the first time ever in my life I've met Palestinians as human beings. Not as uh, workers in the streets, not as terrorists, not as transparent people. I was a victim of the Israeli educational system, and I was so shocked. I remember seeing this old Arab Palestinian lady coming down from the bus with this long, bare, traditional dress, and she had a picture of a six-year-old kid on her chest. Exactly like my wife, Gary, the name of our daughter, Smadari, on her chest. I'm not a religious person. I have no way of uh, explaining what happened to me back then, 19 years ago. All I can tell you that from that moment, I got a reason to get out of bed in the morning. From that moment on, I devote my life to go everywhere possible, to talk to anyone possible, people who want to listen, people who will not listen, to convey this very basic and very simple message which says, this is not our destiny. It's not written anywhere that we must kill each other in this holy land of ours forever. We can change it. We can break once and for all this endless cycle of violence and revenge and retaliation. The only way to do it is simply by talking to each other. Because it will not stop unless we talk. I believe deeply that one can teach himself how to listen. I believe deeply that once you are able to listen to the pain of the other, you can expect the other to listen to your pain. And then, only then, start this very long journey towards reconciliation, maybe some kind of peace in the end. This is a, it's not a simple way. This is a very long and bumpy road, no shortcuts. But this is the only way possible, because the other way leads to nowhere. And the price of the other way is really horrible. So this is what we are trying to do, my dear brother here beside me, Bassam, and the 600 families members of this uh, unique organization. We bang our heads against this very high wall of hatred and fear that divided two nations today. And we put cracks in it, cracks of hope. And through these cracks, a little light comes in, and a little light can drive away a lot of darkness. And we have an enormous ally on our side. And this is the power of our pain. You should know that the power of pain is tremendous. It's very much similar to the nuclear energy. And like this horrible energy, you can use it in order to bring destruction and darkness 
and death to people. And you can use it in order to bring light and hope and warmth. So uh, we go around the country. We go from high school to high school. We talk to young children, Israelis and Palestinians. And we tell them that our blood is exactly the same color. That our pain is exactly the same pain. And our tears are just as bitter. And if uh, we, who pay the highest price possible, if we can talk to each other, then anyone can, then anyone should. Thank you for listening. As you prepare your breakfast, think of others. Don't forget to feed the doves. As you conduct your wars, think of others, of those who seek peace. As you go to pay your water bill, Think of others, of those who only have the clouds to drink from. As you go home, your own home, think of others. Don't forget the people of tents. As you speak freely and express yourself with metaphors, think of others, of those who lost their right to speak. As you sleep and count the stars, Think of others, of those who have no place to sleep or to stay in. As you think of others, distant others, think of yourself and wish you are a candle in the darkness. This is what Mahmoud Darwish says, our national poet, the Palestinian national poet. It's very difficult sometimes to think about others as long as you're stuck in yourself, in your narrative, in your story, in your history, and in your pain. Jalal din Rumi says, beyond right and wrong, there is a field. Meet me there, or let us meet there. Sometimes you discover that the field always exists. It takes decades to understand that, yes, we need to meet each other maybe to survive together or to find another way. I grew up in a very simple and small family. We are 15 brothers and sisters. It's considered a small family in Palestine. Until the age of 12, I never think about the Israelis or the Palestinians or the Muslims. I was far away from this conflict. I born in an elite cave. Uh, when I moved to the village, I start to see strange soldiers who come to my village to control our life and to occupy us. For us as kids, you don't understand why and you don't understand their language. It's very easy to become a fighter or a warrior. We notice that they become crazy when they see the Palestinian flag, and I don't understand why. So together with other four kids, we create a local military group and we start by raising the Palestinian flag, which was a crime in that time, to make the Israeli soldiers crazy. This is how we start. At the age of 16, we find an old weapons in another cave, including two hand grenades and other military materials that we don't know how to use it. Two of my friends throw the two grenades in the Israeli patrols, and of course, in that time, no one killed, no one injured, because we don't know how to use it in a professional way. At the age of 17, we have been arrested. Uh, so the first one gets 21 years in jail, 19, 15, 14, and I get seven years. In jail, I learned that if you know your enemy, you can defeat him or you can kill him. If you only hate him, you will kill yourself. So I start to study Hebrew to know how to kill my enemy, because my enemy speaks Hebrew. We don't know each other. We never learn anything in our schools about the enemy or the Israelis or the Jewish or the occupation. Because in my time, it was a Jordanian school box under the Israeli control. 
so nothing mentioned about the conflict. I watch a movie, by chance, in jail about the Holocaust, and most of the Palestinians, and I believe the Arabs, until now, after 70 years, we believe the Holocaust, it's a big lie, because we don't know anything about it, and it's belonged to our enemies, so even you don't want to know the pain of your enemy. But I remember I want to enjoy this movie to see someone torture those Jews, kill them, arrest them, because I'm in their jail, at least. And after a few minutes, I found myself crying. Get sympathy with those innocent people. It was too much for me. I didn't expect to see such atrocities, even on the TV. I try to convince myself it's just a movie, nothing like this in the reality. There are no human beings can do the same to other human beings. Then I want to understand more about this big lie. It takes me many years, until 2011, before six years, I finished my master's degree about the Holocaust in Bradford University in the UK. But it starts as a tool to know your enemy in order to know how to defeat him. It's a long seven years in jail. In general, it's very difficult to change your mind from violence to nonviolence, armed struggle to peaceful means. It's the opposite. You just become more determined to continue your way, your armed struggle against this brutal enemy, because this is the only way to liberate our land and ourselves. We teach ourselves that their goal is to kill our humanity every moment, and our goal is to survive in order to continue our struggle against this enemy. I get released in 1992 after seven years, and I still believe in armed struggle. 93, we have also agreement between PLO and Israel, and at some point, finally, we have peace. There is no need to continue fighting because this is not our goal. Our goal is to live in peace and security. So I support this agreement like most of the Israelis and the Palestinians, and I get married because I feel stability. Then I discover that I put myself in the other jail, the golden jail, we call it, and I start to have kids, and suddenly I have six kids, which is worse than the Israeli occupation. It's a lot of responsibility. And because I have a very bad life, I want to do everything possible to protect my kids, which is an impossible mission if you live in Palestine or Israel. You cannot protect yourself, and you cannot protect your kids. And sometimes if you survive, it's by chance. It's not a normal life. It's very difficult. It's a long way to change yourself, not to change the world. And always I remember Jalal al-Din Rumi when he say, yesterday I was clever, so I start to change the world. Today I am wise, so I start to change myself. I understand that more than 100 years we are trying to kill each other, to defeat each other, and until now Israel is not safe, and Palestine is not free. We need to change our way to achieve our goal. It's the same goal, to end the Israeli occupation on our land and our people. We never change it, and we will never change it. But even in that time, I understand that to send a suicide bomber to kill Smadar, it's not a really uh, uh, a real message of peace from the Palestinians to the Israelis. We need to fight together against our common enemy, Israelis and Palestinians, and our common enemy is the Israeli occupation as a source of violence and terrorism and atrocities. Then 1994, I start to be active in my society in the Palestinian side that we need to act in a different way. In 2005, I was a co-founder of a group called Combatants for Peace, which is ex-Israeli soldiers and officers who refused to serve in the occupied territories or refused to occupy another people Ramis San was one of those people, and with four uh, ex-prisoners, Palestinians, I was one of them. We discovered that we are the same. We want to kill each other to achieve peace and security. But of course, each one from his point of view. We decide after one year meetings to lay down our weapons, and we start to talk. In the first year, we became 300 members. 
Today we are more than 700 members. And our slogan was, if you want to make peace with your enemy, you need to work with your enemy. Then he became your partner. And this is what Nelson Mandela says. Our goal is to be partners, not friends, not brothers. We are not relatives. If we become friends or brothers, it's much better. But this is not our goal. You're still my brother. <laughs> Two years later, on the 16th of January 2007, an Israeli border police shot and killed my 10 years old daughter, Abir, in the front of her school from a distance 15 to 20 meters in her head from the back. She fell down, and two days later, she passed away in Hadassah Hospital, where she born. Abir was just 10 years old. She don't know anything about the conflict. The distance between Abir and Smadar, it's 10 years. But it's the same killer. The occupation, the hatred, the victimhood mentality. It's very difficult to recognize that there is no revenge, which is very easy. It's very human and very simple. There is no revenge means to kill the rest of the world, you will never meet your daughter again. And the problem, it's nothing to do with your pain. It's an open wound forever, 24 hours, and you will never heal. How you survive, how you deal with this pain. Always I said one Israeli soldier killed my daughter, but more than 100 ex-Israeli soldiers and officers from combatants for peace and uh, bereaved families build Abir's garden in her school, in her memory. This is how to use your pain. In fact, directly I joined the parent circle because I know Rami two years before, and always I want to ask him about Smadar. And always I said to myself, why I need to invest in more sadness in his heart. Then after Abir, I discovered that he never forget, he will never forget. We just try to escape or to run from our pain to our pain. We want to prove that you can use our your pain in a different way, not only for revenge. And revenge, it's, the meaning of revenge, it's not only to kill. There are many meanings for revenge. When I met the victim who killed my daughter after three years in the Israeli court, I said to him, I need you to know that you are not a hero, you are not a warrior, you didn't kill the enemy or the terrorists, you just killed 10 years innocent girl. And if you think it's okay to kill my daughter, enjoy your crime. I don't ask for revenge because I don't take revenge from victims. You are the victim and you are not less victim than your victim. But in any day in your life, if you come to ask me to forgive you, always you will find me there. I will forgive you. It's not because of yourself, it's because of myself. Because I love my daughter very much, and because I have another five kids, they deserve to live in a different way. I don't want my kids to be a victim to you as a victim. We will have peace. We will have peace agreement, for sure. It's a fact. But when? How much blood we need to sign this agreement? Always, I said, the Palestinians didn't kill six million Israelis. And the Israelis didn't kill six million Palestinians. And we can see that there is a German ambassador in Tel Aviv. And there is an Israeli ambassador in Berlin. We cannot keep silence because we have no fear to challenge ourselves, our societies, our culture because we understand that it's a kind of responsibility. We need to raise up our voice against those fanatic groups that scare from the future. We want to protect our kids and our lives. I learned that keep silence, you will die. Speak, you will die. So speak and die, or speak 
in order to survive. Thank you very much. I, uh, with your permission, I would like to uh, finish with uh, a personal message. What will be the uh, message that you will take out of these words of us? What will you uh, dream of tonight? And what will be the actions that you will take tomorrow morning? Uh, my late father, Hungarian-born, uh, Holocaust survivor, spent one year in Auschwitz. Seventy years ago, while they took my grandparents to the ovens here in Europe, the free and civilized world stood aside and never lifted one finger. And today, 70 years later, while these two crazy Nations of ours are massacring each other without any mercy. While this genocide is taking place in Syria and people are drowning in the Mediterranean every minute. And atrocities wherever you look. The free and civilized world is still standing aside, doing nothing, which is a shame, which is a crime, which is a horror, unforgivable. For the last uh, 17 years, ever since Camp David until today, more than 10,000 people have died in our region. Most of them are innocent. Too many of them are young children. This is a crime against humanity. And standing aside while a crime is being committed is also a crime. Now we do not ask people to bring and import our conflict to your countries. You have enough troubles of your own, especially today. We don't want you to be pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian. We demand of you to be pro-peace. We demand of you to be pro-justice. And against this ongoing situation in which one people is occupying and dominating another, this is the essence of evil. It must be changed. And I will finish with the message of a Jew. And I am a Jew with the utmost respect to my people, to my tradition, to my history my religion, and I will tell you that uh, controlling and humiliating millions and millions of people for so many years without any democratic right is not Jewish, period. No two ways about it. And being against it is not anti-Semitism. And if you get into an argument, you can quote me. Thank you very much. Yeah.